Science that's cool. Paper so unique. Welcome back to Cool Ass Papers that I read this week. What's up, nerds? Have you ever wondered how chemo actually gets into cancer? I'm Addy C, PhD in chemical engineering. Every week I break down some of the best papers that I've read in the field of biomedical engineering in a way that you and Nana can understand. This week is not only one of my personal favorite papers of all time, but I firmly believe it'll be one of the most influential papers in the field of nanotechnology for treating cancer. It's simply called the entry of nanoparticles into solid tumors, and it comes out of Warren Chan's lab from the University of Toronto. And put simply, it's trying to tackle what happens to certain types of nanoparticles that are designed to treat cancer, specifically on how they enter cancer cells after being injected into your bloodstream. But first we need a little bit of background because this is where the excitement really comes from. We're gonna zoom all the way back to nanoparticles in general. The idea is basically that if you take a current medicine and you put it into a nanoparticle, this nanoparticle can bring that drug to the diseased tissue and avoid the healthy cells around it, thus reducing the side effects. Nanoparticles for treating diseases, especially cancer, has been very hit or miss. And so researchers always ask themselves, why? What's stopping nanoparticles from being good for all cancers. And now we're gonna switch gears a little bit to something called the enhanced permeability and retention effect, AKA the EPR effect. For the last 30 years, the EPR effect is what most scientists think is the reason why nanoparticles can get into cancer in the first place. And as per our good friends over at Wikipedia, they say that the enhanced permeability and retention effect is a controversial concept. You know that when Wikipedia says it's controversial, things are pretty tough. By which molecules of certain sizes tend to accumulate in tumor tissue much more than they do in normal tissues. In order for tumor cells to grow quickly, they must stimulate the production of blood vessels. Because these blood vessels need to be made so quickly, they often have defects with wide spaces that can fit nanoparticle drugs into them. A good friend of mine once compared this to trying to build a house. Imagine in one scenario, you have to build an entire house in just a week. Because you have such little time to do that, you're more likely to make mistakes. Those mistakes might lead to some holes somewhere in your house for rain and mice and other bad things to get in. But imagine you had unlimited time. You'd probably make a much better house because you would have time to correct those mistakes and build a house that is very sturdy. In this example, the cancer tissue is the rush stinky house, but your healthy tissues are the nice sturdy house. So this is one of my favorite diagrams of what the EPR effect looks like. Don't worry too much about all the very specific cells. I'll walk you through the important ones. But basically what you can see are nanoparticles visualized in teal and they're moving from left to right as they're going through your blood. You'll also notice on the left-hand side, you have something called normal vessels or the blood vessels that are just around regular tissues. And on the right-hand side, you have tumor vessels or the vessels that are around cancer cells. What you'll notice is that in normal vessels, the spaces between these pink cells are very, very small. They're so small that the nanoparticles can't get in. But when you look at the right-hand side where the cancer is, those spaces between those pink cells are much, much bigger, which means it's much, much easier for those nanoparticles to get in. The other assumption that most researchers in the field know is that this all happens passively. There doesn't need to be any specific cellular mechanisms that actually bring these cancer drugs from out of your blood and into cancer tissue. The drugs just slip through the cracks and get in. Warren Chan's lab says that doesn't make any sense because after analyzing papers that were published over the last 10 years, they found that less than 1% of those nanoparticles we're actually getting into cancer. So when they say, hell no, nah, this 30 year old theory has got to be wrong, we should listen. So without further ado, let's break down this masterpiece that was published in Nature Materials. It's important to note that all of these experiments are done in mice. The first thing they wanted to measure was how do nanoparticles get through your blood vessels and into the cancer microenvironment passively. They took nanoparticles made of gold and ejected them into mice that had cancer. They could then take a bunch of complex microscopy images to see what was going on and where these nanoparticles were going. So they looked for three main things in the blood vessels around cancer. Interendothelial gaps, which are spaces between neighboring cells, channels within a single cell, and finally tight junctions, which are the connections between neighboring cells. Based on their images, these people who are way smarter than me could calculate how many of these spaces there were, and then compared that to how many nanoparticles were added to each mouse. They saw that almost 60,000 nanoparticles were getting into each mouse tumor. But if all of those were being entered through these spaces, through these passive methods, they would need 20,000 gaps per millimeter squared, but they could only measure 500. If we go back to our house example, what they basically saw was that the house they made was relatively sturdy, but there was still a lot of junk getting in. So something's not adding up. How the hell did the, all of these nanoparticles get into this tumor in the first place? And this is where things get crazy. They thought, well, it can't be happening passively. 
so it must be happening actively. There must be something within the blood vessels around the cancer that is bringing these nanoparticles into the cancer tissue. So they developed one of the most fascinating experiments I have ever seen, the zombie model. So they had two test groups, a control group shown in the top and a zombie group shown in the bottom. Now in the control group, everything looked normal. You took a regular mouse, you inject the nanoparticles into the vein in their tails, and then you fixate the mice, which is basically freezing them so that you can measure to see where the nanoparticles are going and how many get into cancer. And in theory, you should see some amount of passive and active, whatever is normally going on in cancer. It's just a regular mouse doing its regular thing. But then they made zombie mice where they would unalive the mice and fixate them using formaldehyde. This means that the mice can't pump their own blood. So the researchers would have to circulate the nanoparticles for them. Since the mice cellular mechanisms were unavailable at the time, this was their way of modeling passive entry, but not active entry into tumors. Some of the data is almost as absurd as the model itself. They stained the gold nanoparticles and cancer tissue to determine where the nanoparticles were going. And they did this in both the zombie and the control model. In the zombie model, 85% of the gold nanoparticles could not leave their blood vessels, which means they didn't actually get into cancer tissue. On the other hand, in the control mice, that was only 25%. The control mice also saw that around 20% of those nanoparticles came close to getting into cancer tissue, but but couldn't quite do it. And finally, the most amazing part, 49% of the nanoparticles in this control group were able to get into the cancer tissue. Oh, wow, that sounds pretty good. How much got into the zombie mice? Zero, zero percent. There's a lot of weird pictures and very specific numbers. So let's break down their findings into a nice little summary. One, they found that even though there were very few spaces for nanoparticles to enter cancer passively, a lot of nanoparticles did. Two is the nanoparticles could only enter cancerous tissue when those mice had mechanisms that force cells to bring them through the blood vessels and into cancer. And this couldn't happen when it was done passively. And three, they made a mother zombie mouse. And if you'll let me make one more quick comparison to the houses, what they saw is that cancers more or less are building a McMansion, but in order to get stuff in there, someone has to actively stand on their yard and throw stuff into it. So you're probably thinking, oh, that's so cool, but it's just in mice, who cares? Well, they thought of that too, because they imaged the biopsies from actual human cancers and saw that the structures were very similar to what they saw in mice. And they think that their theories would apply to humans too. I just want to take it back for a second, just to really dump on the EPR effect. Remember the EPR effect, that thing that we all hate? Most people think that it wasn't working in humans because it's something that just doesn't happen in humans. Even though the mice models look good, the human models don't. Which is why Warren Chan's group was really trying to hammer home this point. That yeah, there are a lot of structural similarities between these mice models they're using and human cancer models. So what's next? Like any good scientist, these authors admit that there is still a lot of work to do. They suggest a few things. First, they want to decipher the specific cellular mechanisms that bring nanoparticles into cancer. Use different nanoparticles with different shapes and sizes and come up with actual solutions to manipulate these cellular mechanisms. Regardless, the implications for this paper are massive. Imagine you have a family member who's taking a nanoparticle-based chemotherapy. If we know exactly how that nanoparticle works, we can design it so that it has no side effects and ultimately improve the chemotherapy experience. So we're gonna have to wait and see just how far this goes. As a little spoiler alert, they already have a part two, which I'm definitely making a video on. If you'd like to see other videos similar to this, but in small bite-sized form, come follow me over on Instagram and TikTok, where I do paper breakdowns in 90 seconds or less. If you learned something, give this video a like and consider subscribing. If I miss something, let me know down below. But with that, see you later, nerds. And don't forget to tell someone you love them.